Over the years, I have tried various ways of producing my own power, from small wind turbines over various backup generators to different solar setups and even experiments with hydroelectric systems. And by now, my workshop generates its own power, at least during the summer, that is, through an off-grid photovoltaic system with battery storage. During the darker and colder half of the year, that system produces much less power though, especially on overcast days, of which we have a lot. Lately, I've actually been more interested in hydropower, but my car broke down and I simply can't continue my experiments on the water wheel until I'm able to haul it around again. This opened up the opportunity though to have a look at another off-grid idea. The workshop is heated with firewood that I'm usually able to acquire almost for free, if you don't count the work, that is. And using a solar powered saw, I'm able to process the wood and heat the shop with an old wood stove, which belongs to my landlords. We tried to install a newer, more efficient stove years ago, but they refused, so this is simply what we're stuck with. The idea to use some of the thermal energy of the big stove to produce electricity came to my mind rather quickly. Combined heat and power is used by many companies here in Germany to generate heat and power in house. And you could certainly try to run a combustion engine on wood gas and use the excess heat to keep the shop warm instead of just burning wood like we do now. And though I've been thinking about building something like that for years, I want to test a completely different approach today. One which could be super low maintenance and which has few or no moving parts. Combining the stove with thermoelectric generators. For that we are going to experiment with the kind of Peltier device which you can now buy for a few bucks a piece online. I will tell you right away though that these experiments will only deal with very small amounts of power and extremely low efficiency. Even in an ideal situation you can only use thermoelectric generators with an efficiency of 3 to 4 percent and we will probably not even get anywhere near that. This will do absolutely nothing to my energy bill or run the shop. It's more of a proof of concept experiment asking the question, can I produce some electric power with a passive device using heat my wood stove generates anyway. An interesting application could be an off-grid cabin whose lighting is powered by the wood stove in a cold winter night. The initial idea for this episode came to me some years ago when I first saw one of these stove fans here. They consist of a Peltier device sandwiched between two differently shaped aluminium extrusions. The thermoelectric generator powers an ordinary brushed DC motor which acts as a fan. You ideally place it at the end of the stove, sucking in relatively cold ambient air helping somewhat in cooling the upper side of the Peltier device and pushing that air over the stove's hot surface where it heats up and is then blown into the room. An ingenious device that doesn't need any external power source. All you need is a temperature differential. Or in other words, one side needs to be kept at a hotter temperature than the other side. It's not enough to heat up the thing, you need the differential. What sounds easy in principle is always much harder in practice though and here is why the stove fan is rather brilliantly designed. I have now heated up the stove to its roundabout maximum surface temperature of 300 to 400 degrees Celsius and I measure the temperature to show you that here. Now during normal operation the stove runs at a temperature closer to 200 to 250 degrees Celsius but even at this medium temperature just placing one of our off-the-shelf Peltier devices on the stove would destroy it within a few minutes. In fact, in its data sheet, you can see that the device shouldn't be heated up to more than 100 degrees C and that the temperature difference between hot and cold side shouldn't exceed 70 degrees C. So in other words, we can't work with 250 degrees and a temperature difference of 230 or something like that directly. And here is why the simple but ingenious design of the stove fan comes into play. Apart from its base, the bottom extrusion is simply a slim and long stretched piece of aluminium that while conducting heat relatively well will also cause a considerable temperature drop along its length. An effect that is certainly increased through the airstream of the fan. And as you can see here we can even measure the temperature drop across this device. So how can we use a similar technique to power way more Peltier devices via the surface of the stove? Well, for that I have placed these salvaged aluminium heat sinks on the stove and I put them upside down. 
As you can see, we can measure a clear temperature drop. Whether or not we will actually have to run a fan next to them will be one of the things we'll learn more about during the experiments. So let's try to scale this idea up and generate some power. And this is the point in time where it pays off that I collected a number of big heat sinks over the years. I have thought about throwing them away many times, but in the last moment I always hesitated, because I knew they would come in handy one day. The devices sitting on this massive piece of aluminium are three big thyristors and a temperature switch. I salvaged this heatsink years ago from a big uninterruptible power supply. To be more specific, that was when I built these server props for a German made-for-TV movie, if you remember that. After unscrewing the components and wiping off the old thermal compound, I use an angle grinder to cut the heatsink in half. The idea here is that instead of having one long stretched thin piece of aluminium, we are going to have a number of thin bridges picking up heat from the stove to power 12 Peltier devices at once that will be connected in series. In order to attach these components to the surface, of the heatsink, I'm applying a thin layer of highly temperature resistant black silicone to one side of the devices and glue them to the surface. The Peltier devices are then connected in series, here in pairs of three, and all wires that might touch the heatsink to lead outside are protected against heat with these white heat resistant hoses. With one side attached to the lower half with black silicone, I used thermal compound to close the gap to the top half heatsink. The idea being that good thermal conductivity will be more important on the cool side since we try to actively drop the temperature on the hot side down from the excessive heat of the stove surface anyway. After placing the heatsink onto the stove top, the temperature in the gap as well as the voltage across the Peltier devices start to rise. With no prior testing, there is no way of knowing yet if this particular heatsink design will stabilize at a safe and sufficient working point. Overheat them and you just lost 60 bucks right there. That's why I try to be careful here. And after a few minutes we measure roughly 7 volts across the series of devices. And that is actually enough to power a bunch of LEDs that we connected. This might not look like much for some of you, but it means a lot to me, because it means that I have proof of concept and this is the first time in my life that I have been able to generate electric power from a wood fire. What we have to do next is to build a better dummy load and some variations of this heatsink design to find out how much potential there is and in which direction we need to go from here. The first heatsink we use seems to stabilize at a rather safe working point. With its long and thin fins, the temperature at the bottom side of the Peltier devices is low enough so that they don't get damaged, even when sitting on the stove top for a prolonged period of time. However, the comparatively low temperature differential will also mean a low voltage across the devices. In other words, in the next step I'm building a similar setup, but with shorter and thicker cooling fins that will result in less of a temperature drop. While the first heatsink was salvaged from an industrial UPS, these heatsinks are salvaged from broken audio amplifiers. If you find any broken audio amps from the late 90s or early 2000s, you are certain to find heatsinks of this size that you can salvage from them. Now, I have repaired many audio amps in my life, but I'm a friend of classic equipment of the 60s, 70s and 80s, while I always had a dislike for most 2000s era equipment. When these devices are broken, at least in this country, you can get them basically for free. Since the heat sinks don't have exactly the same size, my trusty Isola saw is called to action once again. And using two more heat sinks of a similar style, I built a second module which also carries eight Peltier devices. Only this time the cooling fins are arranged in a 90 degree angle. I believe that that might make sense because when you place a fan next to the top side, you will be able to actively cool the top while the lower heat sink should stay comparatively unaffected. Again, I used black silicone for the bottom and thermal paste for the top, and this time some MS polymer is used so the top heat sink won't fall off. According to the manufacturer, it should stay stable even at around 100 degrees Celsius. 
While the silicone on our new models is drying, we will also need a better experimental load than the short string of LEDs we used for the first test. As I mentioned before, I pictured a cabin with lighting powered by the wood stove as a potential application. Similarly, the workshop always needs additional lighting for filming purposes, especially at the dark time of the year. For filming, it is often better to have a large luminous area rather than concentrated point-shaped light sources. Therefore, our experimental load will be a lamp that might be used for filming. I salvaged this piece of aluminium from a scrapyard and will now glue a ton of LED strips onto its surface. While the shiny aluminium will act as a reflector in the back, I will later build a lightweight frame around it and cover the LEDs with a diffuser. For the purposes of this video, the lamp will stay in its rudimentary form though, where we can choose between using all the LEDs and just every second strip. So let's start by testing just one of the modules with half the LEDs. Moment of truth. So I think it's a pretty neat result. This is something you can work with. So let's connect both modules in series then and power all LEDs at the same time. Not bad at all. It wouldn't be enough for the workshop, of course, but in a cabin, maybe. So even though this is a ton of LEDs, the actual power we are generating here according to my measurements is still only 2 to 3 watts. And there is a big problem. While we were in a safe spot with the first heatsink, this design gets too hot when placed onto the stovetop directly. After letting this run for a while and heating up the stove too much maybe, some of the Peltier devices were damaged and the lights went out. So it seems we might try to change the design of the modules once again. The next module will be built using this heatsink from a broken VFD from a scrapyard. The heatsink is really massive and if we wanted to, we could also use the fans that come with it already. Since I have only one heatsink this size, I will build a counterpiece from scratch now. Or should I say from scrap. After cutting out a piece from this aluminium plate, I make some custom fins from a piece of rectangular aluminium tube that I also found on the scrap. This way I'm able to make these huge shaped sections using an angle grinder and a saw. Also using thermal paste, these U sections are then riveted onto the plate. The cooling fins will once again be arranged in a 90 degree angle to the opposing sink for the reason I explained before. The VFD heatsink will be our cooling side while the self-made part will be used to pick up the heat from the stove top. This time no silicone is used at all and both sides of the Peltier device are covered in thermal paste instead. In order to make sure that the two halves stay together, they are glued with MS polymer along their sides though. The reason why there are so many uninsulated wire connections around the modules, by the way, is so that I can measure voltages from individual Peltier devices during my experiments and possibly find broken ones should they overheat. If it weren't for that, all these connections would be insulated, of course. And our module number four delivers similar results to before, but even after prolonged testing and heating the oven up to around 300 degrees, it remains operational. So I'm really happy with this module here as a preliminary result. However, there are more improvements that I want to make. But first, let us take one of these stove fans apart to find out what kind of power they actually generate or use. For that purpose, a single Allen screw is removed that fastens the propeller onto the motor shaft. And after also unscrewing the back cover, we can free the little DC motor and we proceed by extending the leads both on the Peltier device as well as on the little motor. We are now able to measure voltage and current during normal operation. one5 volts at around 200 milliamps means that the motor runs at 300 milliwatts 
or 0.3 watts. A rather efficient device, but this is also a reality check about the kind of power level we are actually talking about here. There are two more possible improvements that I want to talk about next though. For several reasons I think it would be interesting to see if we could attach these modules to the stove pipe instead of using the top of the stove. One reason being that not every kind of wood stove has a nice even surface like this on top. But a stove pipe that generates power could just be connected to any type of stove. It would also have the advantage that the wires wouldn't have to lead over the hot areas of the stove but could just lead away from the stove altogether. Also, with an old wood burner like this one, a lot of energy is actually lost through the high temperature of the exhaust gases. So I decided to build a replacement pipe with plain surfaces that could be used instead of the original pipe. I was actually looking for a 160 mm square tube, but couldn't source one locally, so I bought four 80 mm tube sections instead. I start by tack welding them all around, before proceeding to fill the gaps by tick welding. A lengthy process, but we need this tube to be practically airtight and I just see no way around that. Eventually I have to grind the welds down, so that the surface is as plain as possible so that it will make good contact with our modules. Next I take a piece of scrap metal and take measurements to make two pieces that will allow us to connect the square midsection to two round adapter pieces that will connect to standard stovepipe. In case you wondered how one would cut anything resembling a round hole with an angle grinder, well this might be one way to do it. And after a while wheeling the surface some holes are drilled into the parts as well. The idea is that this will be one way to attach other components to it later on without having to drill holes into the stovepipe itself. The end pieces are tack welded to the midsection at first then as well. Then I take this short standard stovepipe extension and remove some of the paint before cutting off two sections from its two ends which we will need to join the two different systems. And again the parts are tack welded in place before they are eventually really welded together as airtight as possible. And after that the big Peltier module is fastened to one side of the new stovepipe with a bunch of angles and screws. After removing the old one temporarily, the new pipe is then installed for the purposes of this video. By the way, this is not a permanent change to my heating setup, at least not yet. This is a temporary measure for the sake of experimenting and for this video. So good news I guess, the module is able to generate power from the heat of the pipe. Even though I'm still a little careful here not to fire it up too much, fearing that I might lose my Peltier devices again. So to sum up our results for this experiment, it is possible to generate electric power from the surface of a wood stove or pipe using cheap off-the-shelf Peltier devices and salvaged aluminium heat sinks without any moving parts necessary. However, the amount of power that is generated this way is very limited. And here is where the pot of water comes into play. It is a perspective on what I might do next. Maybe to generate more power safely, we can use a water bath to limit the hot side to the temperature of boiling or nearly boiling water, so that the devices don't get damaged. However, to increase the power yield, the cold side needs to be cooled actively now. For that I'm currently working on a setup with a pump and a heat exchanger. Though that system might yield more power, it would also defy the logic of this first experiment by adding much more complexity and making the system less maintenance free. But be that as it may, if you have any good ideas about how to go about this differently, let me know in the comments. And as always I hope you liked this episode and if that was the case please give it a thumbs up. It is really important to me. And if you want to support future videos please consider making a donation via PayPal. A link for that is under the video or become a supporter on Patreon under patreon.com slash tpai. See you soon.